Welcome to the Free Range Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Livermore. This episode is sponsored by the program on law, communities, and the environment at the University of Virginia School of Law. With me today is Michael Greenstone, who is the Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor in Economics and the Director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. He served as the Chief Economist for President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and he's been working for decades engaged in research and policy development on environmental issues. Michael, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I thought we might begin by talking about, you know, a really important recent climate development, development in the world of climate policy. It's been just over a month as of the time of uh, this recording that we're making, which is the Inflation Reduction Act, a really major piece of legislation. So there's a lot to it, but just to the really small thumbnail is the bills, basically the climate provisions of the bill are a big pot of money, a lot of funding, mostly in the form of tax subsidies for a various kind of suite of decarbonization efforts, roughly to the tune of $400 billion. Uh, we've got tax credits for certain types of energy projects. There's the electricity, electric vehicle tax credit. There's money for homeowners who are going to make improvements like installing heating pumps. There's a provision establishing uh, a green bank to provide funds for clean energy projects. This is a really complex piece of legislation. There's requirements around many of these subsidies, including labor standards, U.S. content standards, and, and so on. Uh, there are provisions to promote fossil fuel leasing on top of that. And as we record, we're in the middle of a debate about what's being referred to as the side deal, which is um, an effort to reform the process of environmental review to make it more developer friendly. So I guess just the, the big picture question, I know there's a lot of moving parts, obviously, as you know as well, um, but what's your general impression of, um, of the legislation? Is it, is it a good thing? Are we in a better place now than we were six months ago on climate policy in the US? So I think the short answer to that question is the period of American exceptionalism around climate policy, and that was not to have a policy, has finally come to an end. Uh, and so I think we, in terms of confronting the climate crisis, we're in a totally different place than we were six months ago. Uh, and uh, that's a great achievement. Uh, I, you know, As you list it, there's many, many details about the IRA, and probably it's too hard to sum them all up into one you know, grade, but there are certainly some elements of it uh, that are uh, look quite terrific. Uh, some of the tax incentives look like they're going to get reductions uh, in CO2 at relatively inexpensive costs. Yeah, I've seen the, the, the report that you were part of um, on, on that. And, and which, so which of, the, which of those provisions have you, have you taken a look at that you think are kind of most promising in, in that regard? Yeah, it's primary. You know, it's primarily the tax incentives for uh, generation of low carbon electricity, uh, and those look like compared to uh, their benefits, where their benefits are the reduction in climate damages uh, that they're going to unlock. Uh, their benefits look, you know, maybe three times larger than their cost. Mm -hmm. Pretty good, <laughs> as as these things go. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just add like. For those of you know your listeners who aren't like in the depths of like cost benefit land, like normally economists get pretty excited when a policy you know ha is like you know one point two times the benefits are one point two times the cost. Like we don't get policies that are uh, where the benefits are three times the cost, and uh, it's really uh, remarkable. I think it is also a reflection uh, of. A important outside event, and that has been the reduction in the costs of mm -hmm. low-carbon energy sources. And so these tame, same tax incentives would not have produced such large carbon reductions, you know, three years ago, five years ago, or ten years ago. It's these guys; these uh, energy sources are much closer to being in the money, and these tax incentives are now pushing them across the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's an interesting story itself, and and how the technology has come along. But maybe just. One you know, general question is kind of an, almost an interpretive question uh, that's kind of come up in the wake of the of this bill and and the political success it um, it realizes right. I mean, we've been working at the United States in general has been, um, as you said, the kind of exception to the rule here uh, in terms of its lack of 
climate policy, especially legislative climate policy. And, um, and there's been efforts, you know, for decades to get something like get something done. And now we've, we finally have something, but one of the, one of the interpretations that I've seen, I'd be curious your take on is that, um, the fact that this is what got over the finish line, some are reading as kind of a rebuke to uh, economists and the role of economists in debates over climate policy. The, the thinking or the argument goes something along the lines of economists have been urging carbon pricing, things like a carbon tax or a cap and trade for decades. And, you know, that's not the policy that we ultimately got. We got something that was subsidy based. Uh, it's much less technologically neutral than um other approaches, there's, there's a lot of provisions in the bill that are targeted to specific technologies. And, you know, there's been a kind of consistent concern amongst some economists that that's a bad idea because you're picking, the government's not very good at picking winners and losers, as the saying goes. And so that's been an interpretation that I've seen. Um, there was a piece in the Times by Lydia DePillis kind of recording some of this and some chatter on Twitter. Um, yeah, I was curious if, if you re if you read the politics this way, if you read the legislation this way, or if you had a, a different take on that. Yeah, you know, I find this kind of navel gazing and the conclusions that have emerged from it really bizarre. Uh, so, like, yep, the bill got across. It got across the fifty fifty Senate. Uh, the vice president cast the fifty first vote, uh, and. It is true that the period of American exceptionalism with respect to having no climate policy has come to an end, but we still are a, a standout in the in the sense that you know of the seven G seven countries, we're the only one uh, that is not using carbon pricing in a in a, in a systematic way, hmm. uh, and I think it's really a, kind of a strange like getting the microscope all the way against a piece of paper to reach the kind of conclusions that uh, mm -hmm. you listed. Uh, and again, I, I celebrate at least some of the features of the IRA that I understand, but uh, it doesn't change the fact uh, that uh, we are picking some winners and losers and probably we're going to miss out on some innovation that would have happened if the been more neutral, although this is more neutral than other policies have been in the past, the proposals in the past. Uh, and, you know, this isn't doing anything really about the economy-wide problem. There's emissions all over the place. Uh, and so, like, what, uh, I don't know, it's not an economist, but, like, what common sense would say is, like, getting the entire economy incentivized on carbon uh, is the way to go. So, I, I, I find it kind of a very strange, possibly self-serving mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in interpretation and one that does also does not account for really the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the U.S. is, I guess we're about 5 billion tons of CO2, metric tons of CO2 now. Uh, the world is 40 billion tons. Uh, and the world seems to be, most of the rest of the world seems capable of buying uh, less expensive uh, abatement than we do. Or the, sorry, I want to be clear. Most of the rest of the G seven, or the rest of the G seven, yeah, right, and and which but which accounts for a good chunk of global emissions, of course. Right. Um, yeah, I think this raises an interesting question. It's one that kind of is coming up. I think now, even just with respect to what we've seen with gasoline prices over the last, I guess, year or six months, um, and how that relates to the kind of political fortunes of folks in Congress. Um, with the, we, have met, we have a midterm election kind of on the horizon. It really does seem that uh, gas prices are a huge input into, and energy prices are a huge input into the political process. And that's globally true, I think, to some extent, but it does seem really salient in the U.S. Um, and I was wondering, and that obviously that relates to, to carbon pricing. And so whenever proposals to price carbon have gotten serious at the national level, uh, there's always an easy kind of opportunity for political opponents to to shoot it down as something that's going to affect energy prices, and that, and that really does seem like something that motivates voters. Um, I wonder if you have, you know, you've been in this debate for a long time. If you have theories about why energy prices seem to have such an impact um, on elections, I mean, one possibility is that you know, that's that's just an impression or that's wrong, um, I guess. Right. It, it's just perceived to have a big effect and it, and it doesn't actually. Um, but there seems to be 
alternative pathways through which concern about energy prices could kind of feed into into politics. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you had any any thoughts on this as an observer over the years. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say a couple things. Uh, what we take away from the swift increase in gas prices around the initiation of the Ukraine war and by the, and now the decline uh, as of late, but what we take away from that I think is not relevant Mm-hmm. It's not the same thing as what a methodical and forceful uh, carbon pricing would look like. Uh, there you would have uh, the price appear, you know, not overnight when people are stuck right. driving a particular kind of car, but rather people would have a chance to adjust in expectation of what was coming and maybe you would phase it in over time. Uh, and the other thing, the reason I think it's kind of a false comparison is uh, – It is a design feature of carbon pricing as to how you uh, distribute uh, the pain, I guess, Mm -hmm. of the higher costs. It's like, and, you know, you could take the money, you could burn it, you could dump it in the ocean, you could put in the general (laughs) revenues of the treasury, or, you know, it does not take like superpowers to come up with a plan uh, to redistribute it, uh, you know, in a a very progressive way. Uh, And so there's plenty of proposals out there that have at their core the idea of introducing carbon pricing, which, as you said, would lead to higher gas prices and higher uh, other prices, Uh, but then having some rebate uh, as part of it, which is, you know, heavily tilted towards people who are going to face the highest cost. But I want to add, like, if the idea is, can you name a carbon pricing policy where there's not a single American out of the 330 million Americans who's... uh, uh, who's you not know, hurt? Well, then of course, of course, there's there's going to be people who will be hurt. Uh, but this is you know you have to add up the people will be harmed versus the larger benefits. And I, I think it's not hard to devise policies where especially lower income Americans are protected uh, and unleashing all kinds of uh, climate benefits. And there's one other point I want to make here. Um, which is sometimes, I, I think it's not fully appreciated. Uh, you, you know, we want to, why does the United States want to cut its emissions? Uh, mm-hmm. it, it wants to cut its emissions. I, I'm, I'm going to try and take a pretty narrow view of the U.S. interests here. Uh, and I, I suppose that, you know, all we cared about was the United States. That may or not, may, may not be right for some people. That's going to be true for some people. It's not. But even for the people who all you cared about was the United States, uh, there is plenty of reason to look uh, for carbon policies or climate policies, uh, be, particularly those that will unlock reductions in other countries. Mm-hmm. Because when a ton gets reduced uh, in Detroit, it produces benefits for all Americans, but it also produces benefits for this world. Similarly, when a ton gets reduced in Mumbai, or doesn't get emitted, or uh, in London, or even in Moscow, it's going to produce benefits for Americans. And so to the degree, so like the benefit of having clear carbon policy, carbon pricing is a really good example of it, not the only one, uh, is that that can go be leveraged uh, in international negotiations for reductions elsewhere. And that's, those aren't abstract things. Those are things that are going to produce benefits for Americans. Uh, and I, I just, I want to get that out because sometimes I worry we get so focused on U.S. emissions kind of as an end in and of itself and kind of there's this larger playing field out there. Yeah, it's a really interesting point because um, I think in a way there's a there's maybe an irony to this. So I take one of your an element of the point you were just making that one of the advantages of of a carbon tax or even maybe even more specifically a cap, you know, that would involve a cap and trade program Mm -hmm. is that you can then go to international negotiations and say, look, we have a mandatory cap. It's very clear, like what our emissions profile is going to look like. But you know, same thing with the carbon price. We we're putting a carbon price of X, 
dollars per unit of emissions. And what we want to see is you guys do something like that. And it's very clear as opposed to what, you know, maybe something like the IRA looks like is we're, we're putting a bunch of money into clean energy development. Um, we project it's going to reduce our emissions by a certain amount, but that's it that lacks that clarity when you're at, on the international stage. So and, yeah, and we sure hope that, like, by the way, that there's adjacent permitting law that would actually right. unlock all of those uh, production of clean energy. Which right, exactly, which is very know, different than a cap. Yeah, very different. Um, so then, but I wonder if that's also it's kind of a feature, but it's also a bug in the sense that part of what is attractive about something like the IRA from a political perspective, or part of the liability of a pricing mechanism is that a pricing mechanism is very clear. <laughs> and that's part of what makes it politically difficult is we can say, look, look, this is what we're doing. We know what the consequences are going to be. Energy prices are going to go up. The mix of energy is going to change. Um, you know, uh, conservation efficiency efforts are going to make sense. So people are going to invest in those. And it's actually, in a sense, that clarity that makes it more politically difficult. I wonder, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I wonder I wonder if that might be partially yeah, the case. I, I think the transparency is uh, both a feature and a bug. Um, you know, there's another thread that cuts through all of this that I think is just worth touching upon for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, the United States is viewed as a kind of a free market place, mm -hmm. uh, at least internationally. Uh, what is strange in the environmental and climate and energy space is I kind of feel like our instinct is to be engineers uh, and not to be free market people. And what, what do I mean by engineers? The, you know, the, people want to put their hands on the machine that's going mm -hmm. to stop the emissions and really feel, are I think, quite uncomfortable uh, with letting market forces sort that out. And so, uh, and I don't know why that's more true here than in some other places or, or why that's even true at all. But uh, I, I think the tangibility of, yes, I am subsidizing water heaters or I am subsidizing uh, windmills. And then so I know I'm going to get more of those things that people feel comfortable about that. But what is lost in that is the goal is not more windmills. The goal is not more efficient water heaters or whatever it is, uh, the goal is less carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, time and time again, we have found that when you go for these bank shot policies, uh, and the bank shot is, uh, you know, not directly targeting the enemy. The enemy here is carbon. It's not, the enemy's not enough windmills. It's too much carbon. Uh, you know, not always, but often we can end up in places we didn't expect with outcomes that we don't like so much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have made myself no friends uh, in kind of energy environment land with one thing I've done is written a couple of papers on what are the returns to energy efficiency uh, investments in the residential sector. Uh, and those have not the and, you know, it's, it's hard to when you name them, it's hard to dislike them. Uh, you know, I want more uh, insulation in my attic mm -hmm. or better windows or whatever it is. It turns out, just because the world is a complicated and messy place, when you test this with, like, real randomized control trials, uh, that, yeah, you can get less energy consumption uh, when you do that. But it turns out that on a cost-per-ton basis, mm -hmm. so, uh, there are a lot more attractive options out there. And so, and I, I, I view that as kind of the fault line on the engineering approach, which is if you're going to insist on putting your hands on it, uh, then you may, and, and, and you're, and on the technology rather than on the CO2, uh, then you might end up with something that is not doing so great on bang for the buck. Yeah. And I was just, I actually want to dig into this because I think it's a really interesting fault line, but I just a little um, anecdote kind of a, along these lines is that a uh, reporter was asking me the other day, um, you know, it's kind of about this bill, like, what do you think about hydrogen or carbon capture and storage and different technologies? And I said, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> and true. I don't want to ever have to try to know. Like, this is what the tricky thing is, is like, I'm not, you know, nobody knows the answer to these questions. And if you get the incentive straight, then the 
people will make bets. It's not like the market. I mean, that's the thing. People, I'm, I'm, not to go on a tangent too much, but you know, people think when folks talk about like the market knowing, that doesn't mean that anybody knows in the market. It's just that people are going to make bets, and then eventually the right people or the correct people, their bets are going to be borne out, and other folks, their bets are not. Yeah, but um, hold on. You should define what do you mean by the right people and the correct people because it's a really important point. Yes, the ones with the ones who make better bets, who make good predictions about what technologies are going to be the lowest cost technologies and most viable ones, right? Yeah, not the right people in the <laughs> right, right thinking people. That's, yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Um, but, you know, I guess the question that I wanted to just delve into a little bit is, I, you know, I think there is this fault line that you described. I totally agree with that. Um, I like the idea of like an industrial, you know, the, the market approach, the free market approach versus kind of an engineering, more centrally directed approach. And there certainly has always been um, that within the environmental energy community. But on climate, really, I do think there was a period of time where a lot of folks were bought into uh, more of a free market approach, more of a price mechanism, cap and trade type system. And there was always going to be some um, elements of central directed kind of laid on top of the pricing mechanism, uh, subsidies for this or clean energy, energy efficiency standards or whatever. And, you know, kind of putting those aside, the, the centerpiece, you know, just going back to the Waxman Markey bill was always the cap and trade. Um, but so let's just stipulate, you're talking about the halcyon days of, let's call yes. them, a two-year window, 2007 to 2009? That's right. That's what I'm yes. talking about. Okay. So there was a presidential election. Both people were saying, uh, right. yeah. yeah. And then there was an effort to get it to Congress, made it to the House, and it died in the Senate. Right. And I guess the, the, what's, what's interesting here is, you know, comparing that, that moment um, with the moment that we just had, in a sense, where the IRA does, is able to get over the finish line. And in principle... It's hard to explain this, I think, because if market mechanisms are the lowest cost approach, which I think is a very good reason to think that's true, um, what is it about the political coalition? And, and I think there's, so I guess that's a question for you if you have any insight in, in, into this, is what, what makes, because you know the cap and dividend that you were describing earlier <clears throat> just seems like a superior policy, but it does seem to be very hard to get off the ground um, in the United States where we're you know, as you said, supposedly culturally predisposed to market mechanisms. Um, I, w I guess the question, the question I have is, do you think it's more of an inside game story where, you know, there are just certain factions in the Democratic Party that prefer the engineering approach? And so if the prospect of bipartisanism, you know, a bipartisan approach is off the table, then the engineering people kind of just have more sway within their own, within their own party? Or is it something about kind of broad perceptions about these bills and the opportunity to kind of go out and demagogue a little bit is is less obvious with the subsidies approach, even though you might think it would be easier if if folks in the U.S. had a very pro-market orientation then you know, opponents of this kind of policy could go out and say, look, this is like a government takeover of the energy sector. Look at this. This, this seems bad. Yeah. So, OK, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me just make a couple points. First, uh, I said this before, I want, I want to say it again. The delta, that is the difference between the clean energy, short cost of clean energy sources and the fossils, has shrunk a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so now something is possible with these kinds of policies to achieve meaningful carbon reduction. That was not true, as I said, three years, five, certainly 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is, I, you know, I can't fully, uh, I, I can't fully, uh, I, I can't fully articulate why this happened, but there is now, my read is an increasing awareness of uh, that climate change is, ha is having impacts today. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's the wildfires, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and so I think there's a much greater sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think all of that, both of those things push towards doing something. Uh, and then now you're asking, in, in a way that wasn't true, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, now you're asking, why did it tilt more towards uh, the technology policies or, or why didn't it tilt towards carbon pricing? Um, I don't know. I, I, you, I think people will be writing books about this for a long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, I will 
say, though, that one thing that I was really struck by uh, is the Green New Deal and Greta and uh, it really galvanized people's interest, I think helped galvanize people's interest in climate change in ways that I was surprised by. Uh, and they were very successful at that. Uh, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. Uh, it is also true that that faction of the environmental movement, part of the environmental movement, is, I think, has historically not been very comfortable with markets. And so maybe because they were the ones who got the ball rolling, their ideas took more, you know, the centerpiece. I'm not, I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I, it, it's, it's a great question. I think we'll be writing dissertations and books about it for a long time. And I, I'm not sure there'll ever be a definitive answer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and that, that seems totally right. And then, um, and maybe we can shift shift gears a little bit just because we probably aren't going to get this fully settled. It's just a, it's a fascinating set of questions. But but thinking, um, you know, guys, kind of shifting shifting gears, maybe um, one of the points that you raise a couple of times is the fact that technology has gotten so much cheaper in the last few years. And, and that really does change kind of everything. It changes how far our subsidies go. It actually changes, you know, how how much of a price you would have to put on. Um, it changes the effects of a price. Let's say whatever the price you put on, you're gonna get more um, emissions reductions um, if the substitute technologies are cheaper. So um, what are your thoughts on, you know, kind of how that came about? Is it, because um, again, it, was it in anticipation of, of a change in policy or is it just normal technological development and and we all just kind of get the benefit of waiting a few years and now um, and now the technology is in a, in a better place? Yeah, it's a, that is another great question that I, I don't think we have definitive answers to. I think some there are some facts that seem directionally to have contributed to it. Uh, you know, Germany and Spain and some other parts of the EU's focus on uh, building out these technologies to get them down their cost curves. I think that certainly played a role. Uh, China's massive investment in uh, these technologies and subsidizing them, their development has surely played a role. I think importantly, and I was in the Obama administration, but some of the things the Obama administration did to help uh, quicken the pace of uh, understanding about these technologies probably also helped. I think state renewable portfolio standards probably also helped the United States. Um, I think there were a mix of things uh, that caused some what economists like to think of as non-appropriable learning. That is, I learned something about how to build better windmills and the Michael Livermore uh, competing company. Some of that spills over on them and they benefit from that as well. Uh, and so I think there was a lot of that going on and there were probably a mix of factors uh, that were juicing it. But, uh, you know, I think we should stand back in awe uh, the reduction in solar prices and the reduction in batteries, I, I think really only a tiny minority of people could have, would have predicted or were predicting them, you know, mm -hmm. a decade ago. We got lucky. Mm -hmm. It turns out, you know, there's, there's a variety of different environmental experiences that we had in the environmental space where with some pushing from policy, um, whether it's a, a pricing mechanism or it's a regulatory approach or it's a subsidies approach, you get you do get these really important, profound um, effects. In part because technology just kind of leaps leaps forward in unexpected ways. So, of course, I'm thinking of the sulfur dioxide program in the United States, where we just get these incredible uh, reductions that were kind of at low cost that were just not anticipated at the time of the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. Yep. Uh, so, and I, you know, I think that's a validation of hanging prices and letting people sort it out. Um, I do, you know, I want to step back for one second. You know, there are two basic market failures uh, with respect to climate change. The first mm -hmm. is just that you get to pollute uh, and largely don't have to pay for it. Uh, and the second is uh, on basic R&D, and I would mm -hmm. even say basic R&D and demonstration, mm -hmm. which I would really consider part of basic R&D. Uh, and that is this idea that there's a whole bunch of learning that has to take place. No company has it in their interest to do it. 
all because some of it, they'll do less of it than a social album because some of it will spill over, as I described a minute ago. Uh, and there's just such a strong case for uh, like for government support of that. And so, uh, you know, if I were king of the world, I would be shooting tons of money at the wall on all kinds of things that might reduce, uh, uh, m m might develop new technologies that are in their early stages or demonstrate kind of maturing technologies about how we can build them at scale and things like that. And, you know, when you turn over those cards, a couple of them are going to, you know, I think we have a long history. A couple of them will turn out to be great. Uh, many will turn out crappy, but that, that's totally fine. That's that's expected in some ways. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, you know, as, as we're kind of, you know, thinking about um, the role of role of economics in in, the, in this policy debate, one of the things that was also kind of struck me um, in this domain is the importance of economic forecasting here. And actually the predicting technology kind of relates to this because that's part of one of the most, that's probably the most difficult or it's certainly one of the most difficult pieces of say predicting what the effects of this bill are gonna be. Um, the Rhodium Group, um, which, which you're familiar with of course, is um, did a lot of very influential, uh, I think, uh, predictions on uh, what, the, what the emissions consequences are gonna be and technology is just is, is an inherent or making guesses about technologies is an inherent part of that enterprise. So I wonder it kind of two things I think are interesting about about this. So one is just your thoughts on the role of economic forecasting and the the difficulty of that um, as it relates to to you know emissions and and so on uh, in the in the policy domain and and its influence. The fact that it seems to be really really influential even if um, the tools that economists might rec recommend, like carbon pricing, are not, you know, weren't carrying the day. The economic forecasts were certainly used as an input into the policymaking process, a really important input. Yes, I think uh, it's awesome to uh, choose policy when you're not blindfolded. Uh, and I think there was a lot of good work done to kind of assess what these policies uh, could produce in terms of carbon reductions. Uh, and uh, the Rodin Group has been at the absolute forefront and uh, providing thoughtful, clear, fair, totally level analysis. Uh, and, uh, you know, they deserve a lot of credit in my book. You know, another area where there's like forecasting going on uh, is probably trying to understand uh, what the impacts of climate change are going to be, mm -hmm. the damages from climate change. And that's, I think, that I know that space much better than the economic forecasting uh, of which technologies are going to win. And in that space, you know, I think we are totally at the dawn of a new era mm. uh, and a very, very exciting time. And, uh, you know, I think there, the intellectual lineage is that uh, Bill Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize at Yale, kind of laid out this foundation for how to think about the problem, but he was stuck in a period where there was like crappy computers and there wasn't a lot of access to data. Uh, and so he he did like totally reasonable things. Like he made, took what data was available and made some assumptions and extrapolated them and kind of went with it and laid this foundation for how to think about everything. Uh, now you could think of that as like laying out, you know, like a body and now we're like, have all this data and these great big computers and we can do all kinds of amazing things. Uh, and it's like, we're taking that body and we're putting muscles in it and bones and like, you know, turning it into like a m much more nuanced and rich understanding of what the impacts of climate change will be. And that a lot of that uh, work is, uh, you, you know, I have to admit, like, uh, is like, being done by this uh, group that I helped set up with Trevor Hauser and Saul Shung and Bob Kopp called the Climate Impact Lab, where we're uh, really trying to take what was kind of mathematical best guesses and flesh it out with data and evidence. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's talk about the, 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 that next generation of, of maybe broadly we could talk about, you know, social cost of carbon and, and climate forecasting. Maybe one thing to kind of get on the table, I think uh, folks are sometimes unclear about, is the difference between, say, what 
folks associated with the Climate Impact Center and even Nordhaus and more broadly the, the way that economists uh, go about the business of doing uh, you know, uh, these, this modeling versus what you see at the, the Intergovernmental Cl uh, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC models, those types of um, forecasts. You know, I, I see those as being like really two fundamentally different uh, enterprises. And maybe maybe you could kind of explain um, how the work that you does kind of fits into or differs from the, the climate models that I think a lot of people um, who are outside of the really the really the inside game of of policy analysis uh, might might see these as all being kind of similar to each other. And the IPCC, of course, gets a, a lot of general attention. Yeah, so I kind of, and I've never been on an IPCC panel, uh, I guess you'd say by choice, uh, but they're very large groups of people who, I don't, I don't think they're based, I don't, largely, as my understanding is, they're not doing original analysis, they're kind of trying to mm -hmm. summarize a bunch of articles yeah. that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, with very large teams and people with very different opinions, uh, and kind of really excellent review pieces. Uh, what the Climate Impact Lab is trying to do is actually say, you know what, we can do better than what has been done in the past in understanding what the impacts of climate change will be uh, and kind of build up from scratch in empirically founded uh, estimates of what climate damages will be and then with a special focus uh, on the social cost of carbon, which is the, which are the damages associated with the release of an additional ton of CO2. Okay. So, so one question I, I have for, um, so, so the, um, when you say from the ground up, this is the, this is in a sense, the distinctiveness of a lot of this project, right? Because in the, as you were describing the Nordhaus methodology and a lot of the kind of the premier models, Peer reviewed, very useful um, first generation models are taking a lot, are really kind of building their uh, uh, the estimate of climate damages from a top, from a top down, right? And so when you talk about building it from the ground up, like what, a, what, what, what does that mean in practice if you're not making like just a, a general assumption about a relationship between temperature change and global GDP damages? Yeah, so what does it mean in practice? First of all, it means spend a couple of years collecting data. Uh, and so uh, it's not the most glamorous part of this, but uh, we spent a couple of years gathering data on uh, electricity and energy consumption uh, for 95% of the, you know, it ended up being available for about 95% of the world. Uh, collecting data on mortality uh, from about 60%, you know, data sets that cover about 60% of the world uh, and uh, doing similar things for agriculture and all, all the other sectors we looked at. And I think one way to really highlight why it's so important to do that uh, is a finding that comes out of our results is before we started working on this, the assumption was that the relationship between temperature and human mortality uh, was, uh, sorry, that climate change impact on temperature would basically have a zero impact on human mortality. Now, why mm -hmm. was that? Uh, that was effectively saying reductions in very cold days would be almost equally balanced by uh, increases in the number of hot days. Uh, and that was the right conclusion from the available data. Uh, it turned out, though, uh, that most of that data came from like rich places with temperate climates. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like Chicago or London or places or uh, northern European cities. And so like, yeah, getting rid of cold days in Chicago is really good. Uh, it's going to cause less death. Uh, and it's not a hot enough place that you get to really high temperatures mm -hmm. uh, that cause really uh, large increase in mortality. So when you actually have data from the whole world, it turns out that that, relation, that, that kind of balancing uh, that applies in these rich northern places uh, is not true globally. Uh, and there are locations in the world that are, you know, very poorly positioned for climate change, both because they're poor to begin with and they're hot to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, you're not getting the counterbalancing of the reduction in cold days, you're just getting an increase in hot days. Uh, and when you add it all up, it turns out we were understating 
of climate change impact on mortality due to temperature change, probably by a factor of 20. And so I think that is like an illustration of why I kind of think we're at the dawn of a new era. And, you know, another thing that's really, really important about it is uh, we climate, you know, the way we have largely up until uh, recently been talking about climate changes, well, global GDP will change by two or three percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, global temperatures will go up by two degrees C on average, you know, the problem is nobody lives at the average. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're finding is just massive inequality in the impacts of climate change. Uh, and what is true is that if, it, you know, a 2% loss in GDP, just to be very extreme, uh, is uh, like, uh, we, we would feel very differently about a 2% loss of GDP if it was generated uh, by everyone on the planet losing 2% than if, uh, you know, 90% of the people had some massive loss, uh, or sorry, 10% of the people had some massive loss and 90% of the people had no loss. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're uncovering is like the losses are very unequally distributed. Yeah. And so, so I think, I mean, that's a very, really interesting point right there is I think there's kind of two, two things I wanted to touch on as, as you know, in this question of next generation social cost of carbon issues. So one is, um, so adaptation, I'm curious how, what you think the best approach to dealing with adaptation, because it, it, it raises some of the same difficult questions around forecasting. Generally, we were talking about the difficulty of predicting technological change. Adaptation is something that at least in principle could involve a substantial amount of technological change in agriculture, agricultural practices, new, you know, new varieties of of uh, agricultural crops, um, genetic, even potentially, you know, genetic engineering uh, here. Uh, so yeah, building materials or building practices, there's a lot of potential things that would affect uh, how temperature change actually translates to uh, effects on human well-being. So I'm curious, is that something that you just have to make the best assumptions you have, or are there ways to try to validate uh, the predictions that that, that you kind of have in these models and just generally your thoughts on the best way to deal with the question of adaptation uh, okay. in, in the social cost of carbon. Yeah, so the first thing is, I think you have to have uh, the social cost of carbon or any estimate of climate damages. Social cost of carbon is just one particular calculation about climate damages. Uh, you have to include both the benefits and the costs of adaptation. Uh, and the kind of granular local projections that we're able to make in the Climate Impact Lab kind of unlock that. And so uh, there's a really good example, I think, that comes out of this, uh, which is you take the cities of Houston and Seattle. They are both very, very rich by global standards. Uh, and uh, they're we, you know, obviously both belong to the United States and have lots of similarities. Maybe there's some differences in state government. But by and large, most different, you know, a lot of differences are like they're way more similar than Houston and Mumbai, why don't we say? Uh, and what is so what we got out of the data is that when a very hot day arrives, so like you know where the average temperature that is the average of the high and the low is maybe ninety five or something, uh, in Houston, basically nobody dies. Uh, but when that arrives in Seattle, there's very you know there's quite elevated rates of mortality. Uh, and why is that? Uh, that reflects adaptations. Those kinds of days arrive in Houston all the time, or, or maybe not all the time, but with some frequency. And so people in Houston have adapted their lives, adapted their buildings, uh, you know, purchased air conditioning, a whole series of things to protect themselves when those days come. In Seattle, it's not worth it because those days don't, currently don't come very often. And in some sense, they're, you know, it's a nasty way that economists talk, choosing to spend their money on something else, which is when those days arrive, leads to elevated mortality there. Uh, and what we put at the center of our efforts at the Climate Impact Lab uh, is to measure both the benefits, that is the reduction uh, in mortality when a hot day arrives from adaptation, as well as accounting for the costs. And it's absolutely critical uh, the, the cost of those adaptations. It's absolutely critical to do that in, uh, to get in order to get 
uh, an accurate estimate of what climate damages will be. Uh, so that's one point I want to make. I just want to make a second point, which I think is related to your question, which is if you are going to unleash companies, Monsanto, to figure out what seeds are needed and things like that, uh, it is not okay to just know what's going to happen either globally or at the country level uh, in response to climate change. You, you have to have local estimates. So in the corn counties, you know, what's going to happen to crop yields. Uh, and so to get the adaptation we need, we have to have visibility at a much more granular level than has been the case uh, with the climate impacts literature to date. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly in terms of informing, that's an important point, informing adaptations. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Like there's someone out there thinking, like, what should I be doing to adapt to climate change? And if all you get is, well, climate change is going to result in a 2% decrease in global GDP, that doesn't really tell you what you're supposed to do in response. It doesn't tell. So to, you know, be snarky, like uh, knowing what's going to happen on average in the U.S. is not going to help Miami prepare for higher, uh, you know, for higher sea, le sea right. levels. So on that distribution, so there's a couple of points that, that you know, you're kind of making about distribution. So one is just that one that you made, that the impacts are going to be different in different places and planning and adapting is, um, you know, has to account for those differences. Uh, it sounds like you're relatively optimistic. I mean, one of the points I, I make is the difficulty of making fine grain analysis. There's a reason why it's easier to make a prediction about global effects than there is um local effects in Miami, because in some sense, you've you've got the benefit of aggregation and your errors, you know, can point as long as they're uncorrelated, you know, you can kind of uh, take advantage of that. Um, and so it's really tricky, but it does sound like you are optimistic that we can make sensible predictions that are at least useful enough for policy um, making at a more fine grain level. Uh, absolutely. I, I really believe, and I said this at the outset, that we're at the dawn of a new era on understanding what the consequences of climate change are going to be. Uh, and that has as its foundation the use of data uh, and accounting for adaptations, costs and benefits and doing this at a very, uh, you know, I don't want to hesitate, say, but almost hyper local level. So, so then, you know, another feature of distribution, so there's the, what we're talking about right now, which is just uh, differences, essentially, on the ground. There's also kind of how we should be thinking generally about the unfairness of distribution. As you said earlier, 2%, if we all take a 2% haircut, that's not that big of a deal. If, you know... Um, to be extreme, if 2% of the people exactly. die. Right, take 100%, yeah. exactly. So how do you think this should inform something like the social cost of carbon or policy? So, you know, obviously there's a, a long debate that you're familiar with about, you know, a practice like equity weighting in the social cost of carbon where um, effects on people who are less well off are counted more because of the diminishing marginal utility of consumption or just unfairness in general. Um, we've largely not gone that way in the U.S. with respect to the social cost of carbon. I, I'm curious, just, you know, is it something that you think should just kind of be in the background um, of our deliberations as we think about climate change um, and that's that? Or, um, you know, is it something that we should incorporate formally into the social cost of carbon through something like equity weighting or, or something in the middle? Um, yeah, just, you, you know, without taking, you know, to take a stand on any of that stuff. But how do you think about those kinds of questions when thinking about distribution and, and this type of analysis? Yeah, it's a terrific question. Um, so let's start with first principles. First principles is uh, it appears to me that the world cares much more about a poor person losing one dollar than Jeff Bezos losing one dollar. Uh, and that's because a dollar doesn't mean so much to him. The marginal utility of consumption, as you said, is very low for Jeff Bezos and it is for a poor person. Uh, and so if you set aside politics and you set aside governing, like that basic insight should inform how we think about climate damages. Uh, and I, I don't think that's a controversial view. Uh, I think what is more complicated is how you bring that into the federal policymaking apparatus. Uh, and if you were to do that, you know, is climate special or should you be doing that more broadly? Does it spill over to all kinds of other policies? Uh, and, you know, those are difficult uh, and thorny questions. Uh, and I think political, you know, those are probably those are much more political judgments than, 
kind of what would a benign social planner, uh, not that there is one in the world, but were there a benign, so what would a benign social planner want to do? Uh, and so they're just, uh, I think how you think about it is depends very much on which hat do you have on. Like, am I uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, who is uh, running the American government, or am I, you know, kind of a social planner for the world? And so ultimately then it sounds like for the economist then, what is what do, what do you think the role of the economist then is there? Oh, I think the role of the economist is uh, to articulate very clearly what the impacts of climate change look like uh, from these different perspectives. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, they ultimately they're going to turn on you know, very complicated and thorny things like values. Mm -hmm. uh, and do we really care as a society about poor people more, uh, or, you know, losses to poor people more than to rich people? You know, I personally do, uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's a democracy and that kind of has to be sorted out through all the messiness uh, of, of democracy. I should also add, by the way, uh, the, you know, if you were to do a full accounting, you got to do it on the other side of the ledger, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, suppose it, it was carbon pricing that was unlocking uh, carbon reductions. You would then want to track very carefully uh, who uh, was bearing the costs of that carbon pricing and how you felt about that. Right. Okay. Good. So then another, um, you know, since we're in the weeds a little bit on the social cost of carbon. And, I mean, and, well, uh, you've done, the, you know, you have managed to, to avoid saying the verboten circular A4, which will drive your listenership to zero. So, <laughs> so you know, the, some credit for that, right? Yes. Um, but what one alternative that's um, been getting at least a little bit of attention, both I believe within the Biden administration, but also uh, in the broader uh, debate um, within the economics and policy community, um, is this notion that the project that you're describing, actually, that you have a lot of um, optimism about, is the wrong project in a sense um, when we're talking about valuing greenhouse gas reductions. And what we should be doing instead, usually the term that's used is a marginal abatement cost kind of analysis, where the idea is, um, you know what, we know enough to know that we need to de decarbonize. We've selected these dates um, and certain goals um, that's happened at the state level, that's happened at, you know, lots of countries have decarbonization goals. And we really don't need to know too much about the, um, you know, the exact details of damages to set policy at this point, uh, maybe for adaptation purposes. But, you know, we've already set our goals of decarbonization by, you know, 2050 or 2030 or whatever it happens to be. And all we need to know is uh, how much is it going to cost so that we can, on a marginal basis, so that we can kind of decide which policies to pursue. Is it subsidies for that industry or this industry? Is it energy efficiency? Is it clean energy? Is it this? Is it that? That's the other thing. And all we need to do is have essentially a, a projection around what the marginal abatement, what marginal abatement cost uh, do we need to impose in order to get to our goals? And everything else is kind of besides the point or useful, but um, but not really uh, shouldn't be core to how we're uh, implementing policy. So, you know, Nick, uh, Nicholas Stern and Joe Stiglitz have written something to this effect. Um, yeah, I'm curious, curious what your thoughts are on this notion of this kind of alternative to the social cost of carbon. Yeah, so I think it depends. Uh, what I was just with Nick Stern last week in London, and uh, it depends what you think the goal is. Uh, is climate change beyond cost-benefit analysis? Uh, and that is, is there no amount that we should pay, that we should be unwilling to pay? Uh, then I guess I think that's probably right. Then their, their view is right, uh, which is that uh, we should just line up the lowest cost options to get to zero by whatever year. My own view is that that's not correct. Uh, and that climate change is a complicated version of uh, e economic problem, it's, you know, the damages go out a couple centuries when you release it done today. And, but those just add, those don't add conceptual problems. They just add complications and calculation. Uh, and, uh, so I think knowing what the damages are, uh, should give you a sense of how much you're willing to spend. Uh, 
Uh, and, you know, if it costs $5,000 to get rid of a ton of CO2, uh, and getting rid of a ton of CO2 only produces $200 of benefits, I don't think that's such a great idea. Uh, and so I, I dis, I, you know, I basically disagree uh, with the assertion that uh, climate change must be brought to its knees at any cost. Right. I mean, part of the, um, there is a flip side to this, of course, which is we might not have sufficiently ambitious goals. And information about the social cost of carbon can tell us that. Because if we are, you know, sque- if we're not squeezing out enough carbon on a fast enough timeline, then, you know, just looking at marginal abatement costs isn't going to uh, tell us whether that's the case yeah. or not. I, you know, there's another thing that I find a little bizarre about that approach is like, there's this, there's this we that is like lurking here. Uh, the we sometimes takes the form of, uh, I'll start parochially, you know, some, I think sometimes in the United States we think, well, if we could just decarbonize California, uh, everything would be fine and we can stop worrying about the climate change problem. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, emissions from anywhere in the world have the same impact. And then sometimes there's like a we, like, well, if the United States would just do it, then that would be fine. Uh, but in truth, I think we can, it's a mistake to even for one second take our eyes off the ball that it's global emissions that matter. Uh, and, you know, there I want to come back to the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals? The fundamentals are the delta, and the delta is the difference between the cost of the low carbon technologies uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the fossils. And we need that delta to shrink, not just in California or not just in the United States with RA, but we need to make it so that the countries that are really going to be the big drivers of increases uh, in emissions in the coming decades, it's in their own interest as well uh, to reduce uh, to reduce our carbon emissions. And so, so there's this kind of implicit, like, I don't know, is Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz, are they like in charge of global emissions? No, nobody's in charge of global emissions. Uh, and uh, each country is going to decide it on, them, on their own uh, what's good for them. And ultimately, a lot of that's going to turn on what that delta looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it maybe just the, the last questions it, with with respect to that. It, it, and I, I'm not sure if you, if you have thoughts on this, but it does seem like we're in a weird place with respect to global negotiations on climate change. I mean, there's there is the um, the Paris Accord and, and follow ups to that. But it does not really a clear there was a clear picture of what the goal was um, in terms of, you know, international treaty caps that would be allocated in some way. And and now it's 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 a bit of a it's a very unclear pathway forward. So I'm just curious if you had any any broad thoughts on you know ideally what would what would we be shooting for in terms of is it just kind of hope that everybody coordinates in some general way or is there do you have other thoughts on on what we might hope for in terms of global cooperation on this issue going forward? Because as you know, it is fundamentally and will always be a global problem in its in its nature. Yeah. So. I, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I, I, I do find the serenity prayer to uh, be <laughs> super insightful on many things. Uh, I think even on climate policy, which, you know, the essence of it is grant me the wisdom to know the difference between the things I can control and the things I can't. Uh, and I think that's where our focus should be. So where our focus should be is driving down that delta that, again, just repeating myself, the difference between the cost of the low carbon energy sources uh, and the fossils uh, to as small or even negative uh, as humanly possible. And we should be putting our policy through that test. Uh, Is this helpful for them? Uh, And then the second thing is, uh, I think we should be looking for opportunities to leverage our policies for reductions uh, elsewhere in the world, because those reductions elsewhere in the world are going to provide benefits for Americans mm-hmm. and, of course, other people as well. Right. Great. Well, uh, well, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to chat with me, Michael. It's been a, a broad ranging conversation and, and super, super interesting. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Always fun to talk.